When you walk into a closing, the closing package is probably 100, 150 pages. But there's only 20 of those pages that you as a consumer really care about. You should care about your closing disclosure that outlines how much money you're bringing to closing, what fees you're being charged, and all of that. More importantly, you should care about your note, your promise to pay, back the loan amount, and what your interest rate is. What's up, family? Welcome to another episode of Traffic Sales and Profit Show. My name is Lamar Tyler. I'm your host, and today we're going deeper, right? Talking more about principles, information that's going to help you build as we talk about black wealth and black entrepreneurship. Today is no different. I have a very special, special, amazing guest, <laughs> Tiffany Hall. She is the founder, CEO. You told me everything, right? Everything. Like, like chief everything in the chief entire everything. business of the Hall's <laughs> Law Firm. Thank you for coming to the show. No problem. No problem. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and I'm excited because just a minute, I was like putting two, two and two together. I was like, I actually closed on my, the house we live in now at your actual offices. Yeah, you know, I tell people I'm everyone's favorite closing attorney. You know, every time I walk into a building, I close with you. Like, right, yeah. my favorite closing attorney. I didn't even realize yes, it. Didn't even <laughs> so, so this is amazing. So, I want to start because um, a lot. I want to get into you know the show transition out of the show, um, what you do just in the day to day of your business and the importance of what you do. But first, always curious, like how'd you even get into becoming a closing attorney, running a successful firm? Like, like was that something? Growing up, you were like, hey, I want to be an attorney and I want to be in real estate? No, or, absolutely like, how, how'd you get not. There? So as when I was a child, I always wanted to be an attorney. My idea of being an attorney, I remember watching, you know, those judge shows. Mm -hmm. And I went to my mom and I was like, I want to be an attorney. So if me and my husband get divorced, I'm going to kick him out of my house and not, <laughs> you know, the other way around. That was my idea of being an attorney, being in somebody's courtroom, fighting, yep. arguing, all of that. Um, so when I went to school, I went to Savannah State University. And when I was graduating, I was getting ready to head to law school. But I ended up getting pregnant with my oldest son, who's now 16. And so pregnancy kind of put law school on pause for a second. Mm -hmm. And instead of going to law school, I went to um, in Augusta, Georgia, this community college and got a paralegal certificate. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to stay on the path, yep. but I needed to just settle down for a little bit because we were broke. We ain't had no money, mm -hmm. you know, and so now we're having to raise a kid. And so I got my paralegal certificate and ended up sending my resume out to every law firm in Augusta, Georgia. And the one that caught me back was a real estate law firm. Mm. And that's the job that I took. I never even knew that law was associated with real estate. Mm. It was only me getting that job and realizing it um, and putting two and two together because we didn't come, I didn't come from a home where we bought houses, where, mm -hmm. I mean, my kids know what I do. They know that law is associated with real estate. They know all of that. Right. I knew nothing. And so that was my first time even being aware that the two were even associated. So that's how I ended up getting in the business. You know, that's good. Cause I feel like a lot of people still don't realize that law is associated. You know, I think we associate uh, you know, agents and brokers. Mm -hmm. I think we associate banks, um, but not like really what happens after that. And and I'm not even I'm not even sure. I don't know. Maybe you let me know. I'm not even sure if people at close still really realize that that's a law firm. Well, yeah, well, maybe not my law firm because yeah. we try not to look like a law firm. <laughs> we really try and make it a place where people come in and they're comfortable yeah. because when you're comfortable, you're more apt to listening mm. instead of being intimidated and just not asking questions when you should ask questions. Mm. But the thing is in real estate, not all lawyers have to be associated with the closing. It mm. depends on what state you're in. So in the state of Georgia, you are required to close with a licensed Georgia attorney. But if you go to Florida, if you go to California, you go to all these other different states, they're title company states. And you mm -hmm. don't have to be an attorney to own a title company to clear title. So it all depends on what market that you're in. Mm -hmm. But in the state of Georgia, you have to close in front of a licensed attorney. Mm. And so you, you pointed out something, or you said something I want to point out, that asking questions piece. Because I feel like a lot of times people get to that closing table and they feel like, 
I'm, I don't have a choice. Like at this point, they feel like it's a point of no return. Right. Um, you know, I don't have a choice. Um, sometimes things come up to closing table. Or, All the or, time. <laughs> or even, even though they feel like I have a choice, I think a lot of times people are so emotionally invested at that point to where like they can't imagine walking away from that table and not having that home or that house or whatever it may be. Like you seen that or? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, people walk in and I like to kind of calm people's nerves, you know, because when you walk into a closing, the closing package is probably 100, 150 pages. But there's only 20 of those pages that you as a consumer really care about. You should care about your closing disclosure that outlines how much money you're bringing to closing, what fees you're being charged and all of that. More importantly, you should care about your note, your promise to pay back the loan amount and what your interest rate is. So if your interest rate is let's say your lender the whole time has been disclosing to you 3.25, but you get to the closing table and it says 6%, I'm not signing that note. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And those are the things that I point out to the buyers. Like, hey, is this the interest rate that you were expecting? Is this your payment that you were expecting? And more over that, like your payment will not forever be your payment because principal and interest will remain the same because you got a fixed rate, but your insurance, your taxes, those are things that change. Mm -hmm. As your um, house increases in value, your taxes are gonna go high. And so if your taxes is escrowed through your payment, that means your payment is gonna increase as your taxes increase. And a lot of people don't know that because some people come in like, my payment's supposed to be $1,500 and mm -hmm. you know, next year they call me and now their payment is $1,600 and I'm like, look, Number one, I don't control those variables. Right, right. But number two, remember when I sat down with you at the closing table and I told you that taxes and insurance can change? That's what happened. And although it may be uncomfortable right now for you, your value is increasing. That means if you went to sell your home or if you needed to go take an equity line, that means you have more money to pull out or you have more money that you're going to get from you know the sale of your home. So although uncomfortable, if you were in an apartment and your landlord increased the rent, you don't get nothing from that. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You get everything from the value of your property increasing. So mm. that, that's so good. Let me let me ask you this. This is um, you know, we recently had an episode where we talked about this and it came up because I'm seeing a lot on social now. So I want to ask your opinion on it. Um, a lot of social conversations that um, people should not own homes now. I feel like I'm hearing it more than ever. Like shouldn't own homes, you should only rent. Um, you know, home ownership is come come some all the other things around it. Like you have a specific take on that. Yeah, people just are unknowledgeable going on the internet saying things <laughs> to get people's attention. Because the, the truth is, back in, let's say, when was COVID, 2019? Yep, so 19, let's say 2015 20. to 2018 through 2019, the average first time home buyer was buying homes at 180,000, 250,000, with their payment being $1,500, right? Mm -hmm. The average rent in Atlanta is $1,600 for a one bedroom or two bedroom apartment. Here you are getting, you know, a three bedroom, four bedroom house for 180 to 250. Well, when COVID hit and the market shifted, those people who bought that home for 180, 250,000 now sold their home for $400,000. So in mm -hmm. two years, these young people, mm -hmm. these first time home buyers, these young black families could sell their home and walk away with 200 plus thousand dollars. If you compare that to, and this is not a fairy tale story. This is not something that only some people, it happened to some people. No, right. it happened to everybody. And so if people on the internet are actually going and telling people like, don't buy a house, you're telling them <laughs> don't, provide an opportunity from your, for your family that they would otherwise not be able to get. Yeah. Who's getting $200,000 in two years? These The average household or income, they were probably making $50,000 or less in that year. But now you're able to walk away with $200,000, $250,000, or if you didn't walk away with it and you kept your house, you can go get an equity line, and it depends on the lender. Like if you go with some of the local credit unions, mm -hmm. they'll allow you to get 100% worth of your equity if your debt-to-income ratio allows it. So now you want to start a business. You can go borrow money from yourself. That's going to be the cheapest interest rate that you get. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the, the quickest money that you can get. You know, you don't have to pull everything. You just pull what you need. So 
the conversation to me is just an att an attention seeker. And mm -hmm. what they'll say is, oh, well, you have to keep up with your house, you know? It's yours. Yes, you do have to keep up with it. You know what I'm saying? But put money aside to, you know, if your HVAC goes bad or buy home warranties. Mm -hmm. There's so many different things. you got to have a place to live. Why not live and make money? Why would you live to make your landlord money? It just doesn't make sense to me. I, I love it. I think, I think that's one of the things that probably over the years um, has, has dawned on me the most, right? And even even in our business. It was like the same same thing. I'd had a detachment. I knew that in my personal life, mm -hmm. but in my business I had a detachment because I was leasing office space for years, for years, for years, and it wasn't until uh, we had some clients that had bought a building, and we went to them and they bought it, and I was like, what you mean? And I always say, like, on that day I realized I was building generational wealth, but for somebody else. Right. In the same way we talk about, like, hey, renting, you know, an apartment from a landlord, I essentially was doing the same thing in my business, and the same thing, my business had to be somewhere, it had to operate somewhere, but on that day I realized, hey, you know what, I can actually own the actual building mm -hmm. my business is in, and instead of paying rent, I can pay mortgage. Um, actually, when we started looking, a lot of times the mortgage was less than the rent. Right. <laughs> that we Especially were in a commercial lot of places. properties. Exactly. Because the market shifted even there, you know. Nobody was working in buildings. Everybody shifted their workers and employees to their homes. So there was no need for commercial spaces. So you could get in and get buildings for less than what you were able to prior to COVID. Even now, most companies, you know, even my workers, I have five workers that work from home. They don't even work in my office. So even the culture around everything changed, shifted the, the commercial business um, and gave people like you opportunities to go mm -hmm. in and find something that's cheaper than, you know, whatever you were paying in rent. Exactly. So hey, I want to talk about um, the TV shows. You were, um, you know, one of the stars of Ladies Who List. And what I'm curious about is uh, whenever I see reality shows and I see uh, real entrepreneurs, like people like with not right. a business launching off of, but right, like, this is what I do. <laughs> yeah, this is what you do. <laughs> you know, it's two different, it's two different right, levels two on, different on reality things. TV. What was the impact of the show on your business? To be honest, for my business, I don't know because I got my business off of social media. Mm -hmm. So I was already exposed in the Atlanta, in the Georgia market. Um, so when people thought of real estate and they thought, thought about African American attorneys, I was one of the ones that they probably, that came up in their mind already, already. just yeah. from what I branded on television. Um, I meant on social, on social media, media, on Instagram. Now when the television came, of course it reached um, an audience as well, but from what I can see and what I gathered, it wasn't the real estate that stuck out for um, most people who watched the show for me. It was um, my story about pretty much mental health mm -hmm. and burnout from working so much and you know trying to achieve success at any cost. And it was, man, who I know in person is the exact person I saw on mm -hmm. television. So for me, the feedback that I got wasn't necessarily, oh, I'm gonna close with Tiffany because she's on this television sure. show. Because I was already branded as that prior to, which is how they found me anyway, mm -hmm. so. That's good. When you talk about, um, I don't wanna go in that mental health piece about burnout for entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. um, what do you advise entrepreneurs, right? Cause, cause it's, a, it's, a, it's a line between, um, you know, I tell people all the time, they say, hey, you know what, I wanna start my own business cause I want, you know, freedom. And I'm like, what kind of freedom do you think? <laughs> right. <laughs> there freedom is no freedom. Freedom free on the side, right? Right, for but, sure. But so at the same time, like you said, if you're, you're pushing and achieving for goals, it takes so much more in the entrepreneurial space, right, to build that business, to get it launched up, right. but still kind of protecting yourself and protecting that mental space. Um, being a business owner is honestly, it's not for everybody. So even the agenda that everybody is pushing now, be an entrepreneur, it's not. Because being a successful entrepreneur and being an entrepreneur mm. are two different things. Anybody can go online and start a business and say I'm selling a product. But if you want a successful business, you have to put 150% in. And that's at the cost of your family, if you have kids, if you're married, it's at the cost of your mental health as well because you don't get to balance that out until you've gotten your business to a place where it runs itself, 
where you have clients that are actually coming in and where you're actually making a profit. Until then, you almost have to run yourself ragged mm -hmm. if you want to be successful. Right. If you're a six or a seven figure entrepreneur, a black business owner, and you don't know where to go, if you feel like you're alone, if you feel like you don't have anyone to talk to that gets how you feel or gets the pressures of being a business owner in today's climate, guess what we do? I want to introduce you to the Traffic, Sales, and Profit Mastermind. Now in the TSP Mastermind, we have a 12-month program that's going to help you reach your next six, seven, or eight figures in business over the course of a year. Now along that year, we have one-on-one -on -one coaching, we have accountability, we have community, we have live events, and everything you need in order to reach the next level. For more information, visit us at www.trafficsalesandprofit.com. So I was doing that and I was on the path to that, doing whatever it took, you know, answering phone calls, staying up late, waking up early, doing all these things, not realizing the effect that it was really having on my mental health until my cup was too full mm -hmm. and it just started overflowing to the point where I then had to remove myself. It wasn't even a choice. Mm -hmm. My mental health said, honey, you ain't doing nothing for a few months until you get yourself together. Um, so what I would say to people is, you know, like we all have to fight our battles. And, and sometimes, you know, when you're running a business, if you want it to be successful, there is no balance where you can keep your mind sane 100% of the time and build this successful business. You might go insane. And a family. Right, and a family. And, and all this stuff. All you might things, yeah. have an insanity moment, you know? But at that time, you gotta realize what you need to do. You gotta implement the things that are gonna prevent you from going to that place, which may mean you have to hire more people. Mm -hmm. But you hire more people, that adds what additional stress, because exactly. now you're taking care of somebody else's family and how they pay their bills, you know? so. At this point in, in my life and in my business, I have the ability to have a therapist. I have the ability to, you know, I have a husband, mm -hmm. so I can rely on him mm -hmm. if I need him. You know, my kids, they're older, they're busy, you know, they're getting older, they're, they're busy. So I have that support and I have that um, unit and I have the funds to be able to hire people to do things where I'm not needed in the business as much for those that don't have that yet um i think you need to ask yourself is it worth it you know like do i really want this yeah or not and do i really want it for myself not what the world is telling you you know because you can get a nine to five and create wealth as well Correct. these same people who bought the homes you know, and got two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. They may have more money than the entrepreneur Most on social do. media. <laughs> Most you know, do. doing that, and they have a peace of mind as well. So you just got to make that decision. But entrepreneurship is not easy. It's not. It's not for the faint of heart. And that's like any industry that you're in. Because if you want it and you want to be successful and you actually want your business to be pr profitable, again, you got to extend yourself. You yeah. know, and it's it's just the reality. You know, and that's good too, because I think what it leads to too is, is starting with those type of goals in mind, knowing that hey, you know what, I'm gonna have to push through these things, but I need to be working towards a team. Right. right we exactly. always talk about nine out of ten black entrepreneurs are still solopreneurs. Right. So if you don't even have that on your, it's part of your vision that hey, I want to build a team. That means you setting yourself up for burnout. Right. In the long run, because you can't do everything. You can't forever. Right. right, like because then you become that black business, the mm. one that doesn't communicate, and it's not that you don't want to communicate. You're right. just so overwhelmed, and you're trying to do everybody's job, you know. And you don't want to be that black business. You don't want to be the one that, you know, like we're stereotyped, yeah. and you don't want to do that. But it, it's a, it's a difficult even thing to have in mind when you think about team. That thought in itself is extremely stressful you know yes. when you're working by yourself you know it's just it's your your mouth that you have to feed so and that's stressful enough because you got to take care of your family whatever but now you talking about now these people are relying on you, on you. Yep. so that's scary and some people don't even want to take on on that yep. you know so I don't know y'all I'm figuring it out <laughs> <laughs> so let, let me ask you this. Uh, so how does life now right um, 
What's the differences in your business, how you operate, how you flow compared to before? You, know, you, you mentioned a the therapist. Yes. So um, I think what it is for me now is setting realistic expectations for myself. Mm -hmm. um, and what that means is I'm not perfect, nor do I strive to be. And sometimes people have that, put that expectation on you as a business mm -hmm. owner for you to get things right every time. I'm not gonna get it right every time, but if something does go wrong, I will make myself available to fix whatever the issue is. You know what I'm saying? That's good. And being okay with that. Being okay with my staff is gonna make mistakes, Tiffany, you're gonna make mistakes. Just follow through when that happens, you mm -hmm. know? putting the people in place and focusing on training because a lot of time as business owners we get frustrated with our employees because they're not doing it the way that we want them mm -hmm. to do it but a lot of times we're not communicating to them what's in our head we just have this expectation that you should know but they shouldn't you know and so I had to shift my mind into let me get all of this out of here and let me put that on paper. Let me continue to train and let you know what my expectations are so that you know what you're striving to be, what, what, um, what I'm looking for you to do. So putting those things in place um, and removing myself as much as I can from the business, stepping in only when necessary. But again, I grew my business to a place where I can do that. It's not something that somebody in the beginning of their business is right. going to be able to do. You know, right. you got to work towards that. And I love what you said, having that goal in mind of in order for me to have as much of a balance or as much as peace of mind as I can as a business owner, I got to have something that I'm working towards. But with me being a first time entrepreneur for my family and all of that, I didn't know what I was working towards. I was just <laughs> working, <laughs> working like right. in order for me to be successful, in order for me to pay my bills, this is what I need to do. You know, because when I touch something, I don't want to just touch stuff just to touch it. Like I, I want this to thrive. I want when people associate, when they see real estate, I want them to think about me. Mm -hmm. awesome. I love it. So. As you were building, you talked about building, as you were building and, and creating what you created today, you, you mentioned the um, role of social media. Like, I wanna talk Ooh. about that. Like, <laughs> were you strategically like, hey, you know what? I'm going to build a clientele base. I'm gonna become the go-to, I'm gonna become known. Using social media was something that you to kinda, you know, some people, some people kinda step into it, realize they got a knack for something and then it takes off. For me, it was, so in the real estate industry, I worked as a paralegal before I became, a, before and during, um, before law school and during law school. And I knew how to do the work, like mm -hmm. what was needed in order to process a file. And I, you know, I had the idea as soon as I graduated, passed the bar, I'm gonna open up my law firm. What I didn't realize is how do you get clients, right? Yeah. So I would literally take my business cards that I had made by myself, you know what I'm saying? And I walked into these real estate brokerages hey, here's my card, <laughs> why don't you close with me? When I would come in, I would see other attorneys' cards up there, you know, and I didn't understand what that was or what that was about. I just thought people were gonna just come use me just because I say. Thought you was doing something. Right, He's I thought like... I was doing something. And I wasn't doing nothing, and I was quickly reminded every time I did that, I would show up to networking events, and everybody would have their own preferred attorneys. And so then I was like, this is relationship based. I'm really wasting my time doing what I was doing. And honestly, it was uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable asking somebody to come use me. Yeah. So one day I was on social media and it was when like the on Instagram, when the hashtags were like a thing. Oh, yep, yep. And I found like Atlanta real estate agent hashtag. And I was like, here's all my people. <laughs> this is where they are. And then that's when the idea, Tiffany, this is, this is your niche. This is how you're going to get your clients because I couldn't go pay to play and establish these relationships with these brokerages that didn't know who I was, didn't right. know if I knew what I was doing. But on Instagram, I can make myself look interesting enough where they're like, who is this black attorney? Because I knew that at that time, yeah, there's several black attorneys in Atlanta, but there was none that were super visible on social media yeah. okay. and so I was like yeah I'm gonna make myself interesting enough where people are gonna be like who is she 
I want to close with her. And I got my first client um, that way. He's a, a He was a, a real estate agent with Keller Williams. And when I got him as a client, at that point I knew, oh, here's the formula and this is what we're going to do. Now, it didn't happen overnight. Yeah. It took years to build that brand and awareness and for people to trust me um, and knowing that I really did know what I was doing. But that's how I fell into it. So would you recommend somebody? Because, you know, I, I think when people uh, hear people's social media stories, they always say, well, that's easy for you because that was when, you know, you can just find the hashtags and use the hashtags and do whatever. Would you recommend someone that's watching now, right, in the same profession, like get started on social media? For today? sure. Where is every, what do you, what do you do when you're not doing nothing? Are you scrolling on social media? Mm. Everybody, that's what they're doing. Everybody is on Facebook. Everybody is on Instagram. That's what people do as part of their <laughs> lives. So you want to be where the people are, and people are, are, are virtually on the Internet. So it doesn't matter if I got started 10 years ago. Mm. People are still on social media. That's where they are. And so if you have a business, if you're not on social media, then you're not doing something right. A lot of people are like, oh, I want to do the traditional route. There is no traditional route. This is the traditional <laughs> route right now. It is now. If yeah, you right. want to be visible and you want to be known, you have to be on social media and you got to be consistent. Because the one time you post may be the one time that somebody is actually looking for what you need, mm. for what they need. Yep. And imagine if you consistently post all the time, then you're grabbing all of those people that may need that service at that time. And so some people are like, oh, I don't have time. It's like, then you don't want to be successful. Like, and it's fine if you don't, but let's not make it a thing of, oh, it's too much. Is your business not important? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's, it's part of, it's working. So you got to shift your thinking instead of like, Oh, people be lying on Instagram and Facebook. Yeah, everybody lie on Facebook and Instagram. It's not for you to figure out whether somebody's being <laughs> truthful or honest. It's for you to just be on there and constantly show that you have a product or a service and that why these people need the product or service from you. you that, know? That's so good because I always tell people, especially service-based businesses, like it's your job to be top of mind. Right, exactly. Be because people don't always need what you have. But when they do need what you have, you need to be like, boom, like instantly. Tiffany. Yeah, right. Yep. Like, like we need to close somewhere. Hey, I know who we closing mm -hmm. with. Don't even send nobody my way. Don't even right. suggest nobody. And, and that top of mind piece you talked about, I always say, like, if I have a service based business, I want to be where when that topic comes up, somebody in that room instantly brings my name mm -hmm. to the table. Right. Um, and then the other thing you made me think about is the fact that folks say, well, I don't want to do the post. I don't want to do. I don't want to do live stream, all this other stuff, but they don't want to advertise either. So like you got to do. They don't want a successful business. <laughs> yeah, like like you got to do I'm one saying. or the other. Like like yeah. you going you know. So so I don't want to pay for advertising, but I'm not gonna do the organic piece. I'm not gonna do the organic piece. I want to pay for advertising. Well, how are you gonna get people to know about your business? To know, yeah, because because the person the person with the best product or service does not win. Right. Right. If nobody knows you exist, like right. like, and I think too many times people are resting on that. So. You know, I love everything you just said about that piece. And sometimes a lot of people think too much into it. They think that everything has to be fancy or you have to spend mm. a lot of money. True. But I always tell people, when I'm looking the most raggediest on Instagram and I'm giving information, that video is the one that goes the furthest. Because people relate, they want to relate yeah. to people that they can identify with. And if you're fancy, like makeup and clothes and everything is just perfect all the time, that's going to be a hard um, pill for most of the population to mm -hmm. swallow. But if they feel like you're just like me, then they're more apt to listening to you. They're more apt to um, wanting to support your business. And balancing that personal and business is super important on um, social media right. as well. They want to, people want to get to know you. When I go places, before they even ask about real estate, they'll ask how my daughter Jolie is doing. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Because they've bought into my family, which because they bought into that and they identify with that, it makes them want to do business with me because they think they know me. I'm like, I ain't never seen you before. <laughs> but you know my kids, you right. know my husband, you know everything about yeah, me. No, like and trust. Yeah, exactly, for sure. I love it. So um, as you transition out of Ladies Who List, 
like what's next for you in the vision for your firm? What's next for you in the vision of other other entrepreneurial ventures like you and your family? Like like what are the, the next things that you're looking to conquer? I hate the question what's next because it always it almost makes me feel like I have to have something to do. Mm -hmm. So with after ladies who list number one I was approached with the television show simply based on what I do for a living so it was just a easy seamless you know thing to do the show because it was based on what I was doing, doing every life. day right and I've always wanted to be a lawyer I'm a lawyer you know I've I've done what I've wanted to do and so instead of me having the what's next it's just whatever's supposed to be for me mm -hmm. i just want that to happen because the goal and dreams that i have for myself i've already accomplished that now mm -hmm. i have three kids i want to help them like what y'all want to do you know what i'm mm -hmm. saying what can i give you impart into you that will help you get to whatever goal or dreams or lack thereof if you don't have those dreams how can i help you know, with your next stage in life. And that's where I am in my life. Um, I love my babies. They are super into sports. And so I'm like, I'm a sports mom. You're like, what you do? I, I watch my babies <laughs> play sports. And so with well, what's that. What sports? Um, so my oldest son wrestles. My middle kid plays um, base, super really good. His, his, um, he's super good at baseball, like okay. really good, outstandingly well. Um, but he plays basketball, um, football, soccer. He does everything. He's the athletic kid. And then my baby girl is my only hope of one of my kids going to school. She's like, <laughs> she wants to be a lawyer. She plays um, basketball. Now she's doing gymnastics. But that is my time of taking that breath of fresh air where I can be present. When I'm at my mm -hmm. children's events, it's the one time I don't have my phone out unless I'm recording them. It's the one time that I'm fully present in that moment. So with that being said, I came up with um, a line. It's called Elevated Sports Mom. Because mm. us sports moms, like, you don't play with us. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, we'll get, we'll probably get kicked out of, you know, the basketball game by the refs. Y'all be yelling. Because y'all be loud. Y'all be, be loud. Be, you yelling at the, at the ref, yelling at the, the coach. coach. Everything. <laughs> at my husband. I seen y'all. He's I telling seen me to out. shut up. And I'm like, no, you know. <laughs> So it's, it's really a whole, to me, it's it's just, it's a lifestyle. Yeah. And with that, I was like, you know what? I'm going to come up with this because this is my passion, like mm -hmm. just being there present with my babies. Um, and just because I'm an entrepreneur, I'm like, I'm going to monetize this <laughs> in some type of way. So I've came up with a brand, Elevated Sports Mom, and it would just be like bags and just apparel because when you're a sports mom, you're really proud of who you are and that your kids play sports, especially if your kids are good. Exactly. Now, if your kids yeah. ain't good, you probably don't <laughs> care. But if your kids are good, like you want to let the whole world know. So that's something that's, that's on my list and on the agenda, um, but I'm not – super pressed about it. I'm mm -hmm. not stressed about it. You know, I just want it to come. To and when the leads. right time it makes itself available, then, you know, we'll see what happens. All right. One question about your daughter. Mm -hmm. um, any hopes, dreams that she continues the firm? I if she wanted to go that route. I just want my, uh, my daughter to be happy and mm -hmm. be peaceful and whatever she wants. I want her to be able to get that. I don't necessarily want her to, because I know the stress that comes mm -hmm. with it. And it's almost like as a mama bear, I want to protect you, you know. Um, but she's going to do her own thing. And if that means her going to, because I don't know if I'm going to practice. She's seven. Mm -hmm. That means I would literally have to you continue. You'd be like LeBron. You'd be like Le law forever. <laughs> you'd be like LeBron. I don't know if God <laughs> has that in the cards for me. So for me, it's it's not a thing that I have to see. Yep. I just want to see her happy and whatever she wants. But she's one of them strong-minded. She reminds me so much of myself. She probably doesn't even want to be associated with me. She want her own thing, you know, like <laughs> this is mine, you know, like this is what I did. So, you know, whatever, whatever happens. We'll see. I love, I'm just always curious about that. I always tell people that my initial goal is not to pass down the business, but to pass down like what the business is built. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, 
uh, the wealth from it, the connections from it, all the people. Like the greatest asset is not the money the business makes, right. but it's like the people I'm connected to because of the business. And the I, knowledge. Community and clients, like the knowledge, yes. expertise, so I'm thinking of that. But uh, the last couple of weeks, I've been around a couple of family businesses, and me and my wife been like, that show is cool, you know, so. <laughs> well, the family business that I am, that we're working to pass down to our kids is real estate. Okay. So my husband is a builder and he's building most of his properties to hold them. So he's not building to sell them. Okay. He's building to hold them and renting them out. And he, do, he does a lot of business in Athens. And so he has several projects where he has five students in the mm -hmm. homes, right? Yeah. And so you're getting the rental income from each individual student that's renting the room. And so our goal is, as a family, is this is how we are going to, this is our retirement. Mm -hmm. And so once we build all these properties, then the family business that we're going to pass down to our children is the access to the equity, the access to the ability to make income and not have to stress the yeah. way that America tells you to stress in order to be successful. Mm -hmm. That's the business that we're going to pass down to our kids. I love it. Yeah. Um, how can people follow you on social? How can they get a hold of you? They say, hey, you know what? I'm in Georgia, and that is who I want to close with. Like, how can they, they track you down? So you can definitely track me down on Instagram. I am always on there. Tiffany Hawes, T-I-F-F-A-N-I, -F -F Hawes, H-A-W-E-S, underscore closing attorney. I'm on Facebook. Like, you can just find me on the Internet. Like, all my <laughs> stuff is just out look, there. It's going to come up, right? Yeah, just type my name in. You'll be able to find me. I love it. I want to thank you so much for coming. Um, thank you for this conversation, especially the, the mental health piece, right? I for feel sure. like that's important. We have a lot of entrepreneurs that watch. And, like, so many pieces of that, right? Um, you know, pacing yourself, um, you know, setting a vision for, like, hey, you know what? Like, this grind that I'm going to have to do to start it off does not have to continue forever. Right. So planning that out so at least you have in the plan to exit from it and don't find yourself 30, 40 years still acting at, and running at the same pace that you right. did when you first started. And it's thing. normal. I think entrepreneurs yeah. need to know that it, it's normal to feel those feelings, those really stressful feelings, like any success. That means you're mm -hmm. on the path to success. Mm -hmm. That's what that means. If you're not stressed and you just chilling, your business probably, you're going to be one of those business owners that, you know, what do they say, like, most businesses open and close in the first year. Exactly. That's going to be, that's going to be you. But the ones that are really passionate and really care about doing a great job and are doing, putting everything, they're all into it. That just simply means you're on the path to success. That's it. I love it. So guys, guess what? You've just completed another episode of the Traffic Sales and Profit Show. I want to thank you for watching. Make sure you tune in next week. When we have another amazing guest. And don't forget, mm -hmm. right, if you got ideas from this, you say, hey, I want to get started. I want to get going. I want to build something. I want to like, like just push further in my path for entrepreneurship. Because Tiffany told me, if it ain't stressful, I ain't doing nothing right. out here, right? Listen, <laughs> <laughs> the most important thing is that you get started today. All right, y'all. Peace. And we'll see you next week. The Combo, your home for conversations on black entrepreneurship and wealth. Available on your favorite platforms.